Imagine a prehistoric battlefield. Men lie dead where they stood, their skulls split open by stone axes. Children cry over fallen mothers. But among the carnage, something else is missing. The young women. They are not in the graves. They are not among the dead. They have been taken. For prehistoric warriors, victory was not complete until the enemy's women were theirs. Archaeological evidence shows that after massacres, young women of reproductive age consistently vanished from the burial record. They were the living spoils of war, carried away, forced into sexual servitude, and absorbed into the bloodlines of the victors. Genetics confirms what the bones cannot say aloud. Entire male lineages vanish from the record, while the DNA of women survives, carried forward generation after generation. This is the silent testimony of conquest. Men erased, women enslaved, their children born into a new tribe that was once their enemy. What cavemen did to the women of defeated enemies was not accidental, nor rare. It was systematic, brutal and adaptive. A dark strategy that shaped human history. To understand it, we must dig into the evidence. Mass graves stripped of women, bones marked by violence and genetic signatures that reveal forced assimilation. This is the hidden story of prehistoric warfare, not just battles fought with clubs and axes, but battles fought over women, whose bodies became both the prize and the weapon of survival. For millennia, humans have imagined their distant ancestors as simple, brutish creatures. Cavemen with clubs, hunting for survival, living in caves, and often, according to popular myth, dragging women by the hair as symbols of conquest. But archaeology and genetic research paint a far darker and more complex picture. In prehistoric warfare, women from defeated groups were often subjected to brutal treatment. They were not only taken as captives, but frequently became victims of sexual violence and forced reproduction, integrated into the victor's clan as slaves, concubines, or essential carriers of future generations. Far from being anomalies, these practices appear as a recurring pattern across prehistoric Europe, the Near East and beyond, extending even into the early historical period. While we lack written records from Paleolithic societies, the combined evidence from mass graves, skeletal trauma, settlement patterns and population genetics tells a chilling story about survival, dominance and reproductive strategy in a world without law or morality. Archaeology provides the clearest window into these practices. Excavations of mass grave sites from the early Neolithic linear band ceramic culture reveal stark patterns. Take the Talheim Death Pit in Germany, dated to roughly 5000 BC. This mass grave contained 34 individuals, including 16 children, 9 adult men, 7 adult women, and 2 adults of indeterminate sex. Researchers noted that young women were strikingly underrepresented a demographic anomaly inconsistent with natural mortality patterns. Scholars interpret this as evidence that women were deliberately spared from execution, likely captured for integration into the victorious community. The very act of waging war, in some cases, may have been motivated not by territory or resources alone, but by the acquisition of women as vital reproductive and social resources. Similarly, the Aspan PR Schletz site in Austria, dating to the same period, contained over 200 individuals killed by blunt force trauma. Once again, women of reproductive age were conspicuously absent from the remains. The skeletal evidence suggests systematic targeting of males for execution, while females were captured. The mass killing was not indiscriminate. Victims were deliberately tortured with broken limbs and cranial fractures serving as both practical and psychological instruments of domination. At schoenach kilianstetten a site in Germany, 26 individuals were found violently killed, including only two women, both older than 40, while younger women and children were missing. The deliberate selection patterns imply that the attackers sought to eliminate competing males while preserving younger females for integration or reproduction. Researchers note that the intentional mutilation of victims, including broken lower limbs, points to organized brutality with a precise objective, rather than random violence. The remains were dumped with little care, devoid of ritual, emphasizing the victim's dehumanized status. Across these sites, a clear and consistent pattern emerges. Young women were often systematically spared from death to be absorbed into the victor's clan, reflecting both strategic reproductive planning and social domination. Genetic evidence further corroborates these findings. 
Studies of ancient DNA reveal that during large-scale population replacements, male lineages frequently disappear while female mitochondrial DNA persists. The Yamnaya migration into Europe around 5000 to 3000 BC provides a stark example. Local men were largely eliminated, while local women were assimilated into the new population. This genetic pattern suggests that victorious males were incorporating defeated women, uh, likely as forced mates, rather than completely exterminating the population. The phenomenon is not limited to prehistoric Europe. In the El Cidron cave in Spain, Neanderthal males were closely related, while the females came from different genetic lineages, indicating that women were moved between groups. This system of patrilocality, still observed in some human societies today, implies that female mobility was often enforced for reproductive and social purposes, rather than being a matter of choice. The implications of these findings are amplified when we consider the precarious survival conditions of early humans. Life was harsh. Most individuals died before reaching 30, disease and injury were constant threats, and childhood mortality was high. In such an environment, every birth was precious, and reproductive control was a central concern of survival. The need to preserve bloodlines, maintain genetic diversity, and ensure the survival of the clan made women critical assets. Sex was not an act of pleasure or intimacy, but a strategic tool for sustaining the group. Captured women were not merely trophies, they were a means of ensuring the continuity of life and the dominance of the victorious males. Evidence from catastrophic environmental events underscores the importance of such practices. The Toba supervolcano eruption approximately 74,000 years ago nearly caused human extinction, creating a population bottleneck. Genetic studies suggest that the number of surviving humans may have dropped to only a few thousand individuals. In these circumstances, reproduction often became a necessity, sometimes forcing unions between close relatives. Skeletal remains from sites like Skul and Kafse Caves in Israel show cranial deformities consistent with repeated inbreeding, physical scars of a species forced into constrained reproductive patterns. These conditions, while horrifying to modern sensibilities, were survival strategies dictated by circumstances, illustrating the extreme pressures shaping prehistoric sexual and social behavior. The interplay between violence, conquest, and reproduction is further illustrated through interactions with other other hominin species. Early modern humans coexisted with Neanderthals, Denisovans, and other archaic groups, often in overlapping territories. Genetic evidence indicates that 1 to 4% of modern Eurasian DNA comes from Neanderthals, while Denisovan DNA contributes up to 6% of the genomes of Melanesians and Aboriginal Australians. Hybrid individuals, such as the Lagavello child in Portugal, a blend of Neanderthal and modern human traits, provide physical evidence of interbreeding. These findings suggest that capturing women from neighboring or competing groups, whether human or archaic, was a recurrent strategy, blending survival, dominance, and reproductive necessity. Historical analogies illuminate these prehistoric behaviors further. In the ancient Near East and biblical accounts, sexual exploitation of captured women was routine, celebrated as spoils of war, and often codified in law. Women were treated as property, their abduction equated with theft from male relatives. These parallels reinforce the view that female captives were valuable as both reproductive and social resources, a pattern that echoes back into prehistory. Archaeological and ethnographic evidence shows that the societal treatment of women was deeply intertwined with survival strategies. Fertility figurines such as the Venus of Willendorf emphasize reproductive capacity, signaling the critical importance of women in ensuring continuity. Cave art from Europe frequently pairs sexual imagery with hunting scenes, symbolically linking reproduction and survival. In some prehistoric rituals, sex may have been communal or ritualized, underscoring its function as a social and reproductive imperative, rather than a personal choice. In this context, violence against women from defeated groups serve both pragmatic and symbolic purposes, consolidating power, securing reproduction, and maintaining social cohesion. Prehistoric raids were often deliberate attempts to capture women, eliminate rival males, and assert dominance. Modern primatology supports these patterns. Chimpanzees and gorillas, for instance, display sexual coercion and male monopolization of females as reproductive strategies. 
In early human groups, physical strength and dominance likely translated directly into reproductive success, while women often faced survival pressures that limited autonomy. Archaeological records reveal blunt force trauma, fractures and other injuries disproportionately on female remains, suggesting cycles of violence targeting women as both prizes and reproductive resources. These injuries, along with missing young women in mass graves, demonstrate the calculated nature of prehistoric conquest. The strategic use of female captives extended beyond individual survival. By integrating women from defeated groups, clans could increase genetic diversity, prevent inbreeding and consolidate alliances. Captivity and enforced reproduction also functioned as tools of dominance. By controlling the reproductive capacity of women, victorious males could control the future of rival groups. The absence of ritual burial for captives or deceased victims, combined with evidence of torture, shows that these women were treated as property and instruments of survival, rather than as members of the human community. The cumulative evidence paints a grim picture of prehistoric society. While some women undoubtedly participated as warriors or leaders, the overwhelming pattern indicates that women from defeated groups were systematically captured, exploited, and absorbed into the victor's clan. Their experiences were marked by violence, coercion, and forced reproductive roles. These practices, though abhorrent by modern standards, were repeated across millennia and continents, leaving enduring traces in the archaeological and genetic record. Present-day humans carry the legacy of these practices in our DNA, social instincts, and cultural memory, reflecting a history where survival often demanded brutal pragmatism. The treatment of women in prehistoric warfare was both systematic and strategic, reflecting broader imperatives of survival, dominance, and reproduction. Mass graves, missing young women, skeletal trauma, and genetic bottlenecks all indicate that prehistoric societies did not merely fight over land or resources. They fought over women. Women were captured, integrated, and forced into reproductive roles, serving as crucial instruments for clan survival. Understanding this harsh reality is essential for interpreting the social and biological history of humanity. The archaeological record, combined with genetic data and historical parallels, provides compelling evidence that the women of defeated groups were among the most vulnerable and exploited members of prehistoric society. They were central to the continuity of life, yet powerless in the face of violence, reflecting a world where survival and reproduction outweighed individual autonomy or moral consideration. In these brutal social systems, women were often treated as property or instruments of survival, their autonomy overridden by the imperatives of reproduction, social cohesion, and clan dominance. Even in the absence of written records, the archaeological and genetic evidence demonstrates that such practices were not incidental, but systematic, shaping population dynamics and leaving an indelible mark on human evolution. Understanding this grim reality challenges modern assumptions about human origins and social structures. It reminds us that our survival as a species has been intertwined with acts of violence, coercion and reproductive strategy, and that the social and ethical norms we take for granted today were absent in these early human societies. The legacy of these practices endures not only in our DNA, but in the deep evolutionary roots of human behavior. Any attempt to comprehend the lives of prehistoric women must confront this harsh truth. They were often victims of conquest, forced assimilation and exploitation, and their experiences were fundamental to the survival of humanity itself.